I do not know how you are situated, but I think I can live here easier and make more money here than up there. You can have steady work all the time and good wages if you are well. I would not go back to Vermont and live as I did the last two or three years. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And just why did Gardner Plimpton bring his family down from Fayetteville, Vermont to here, the Blackstone Valley, to work at the White Machine Works? I mean, most of us think of Vermont as that very bucolic, politically progressive, and very independent state tucked away in the northwest corner of New England. Why would he leave all that behind to come to the Blackstone Valley? Well, if truth be told, by the mid-1800s, Vermont had suffered probably one of the worst environmental catastrophes of the 19th century. In a recent article in the National Trust for Historic Preservation's award-winning magazine, Preservation, the writer, John Fleshman, in his article, Visions of Green, talks about that environmental disaster. The farmer's plow was considered the magic wand of civilization. The farmers who poured into Vermont after the American Revolution practiced subsistence agriculture that depended on family labor, small fields, and domestic animals. Vermont was totally unsuited to these uses. Settlers cleared steep forests that never should have been cut. They plowed thin soils that never should have been cropped. Their pigs and cattle were devastating the woods and hillsides. For these small-scale farmers, Vermont yielded a cold, miserable living. And as soon as better Western lands opened, they began leaving. This is where our story begins with an environmentally devastated Vermont, with another national park site, the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Site in Woodstock, Vermont, the Blackstone Valley with its rich agricultural and industrial landscape, and with the writings of America's first conservationist, George Perkins Marsh. So join me as we connect the dots in weaving together the story of conservation, preserving the fabric and character of our local communities, understanding man's impact on nature and our future, all through the writings of George Perkins Marsh. Every middle-aged man who revisits his birthplace after a few years' absence looks upon another landscape than that which formed the theater of his youth, toils, and pleasures. Now that's a provocative thought, and it's experience we all share and can relate to. The fact that the landscape that you grew up on, you played in, you played sports, went to school, rode your bike, changed so dramatically upon your return home. Now some people say that's necessary, it's progress. Others will claim it's our ruination. Regardless of how you feel, however, you cannot deny that the changes we create are deep and lasting. George Perkins Marsh recognized that early in our country's existence. So we're going to head up to Vermont. We're going to meet with some National Park Service rangers at the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park. You know, rangers are really good about putting things in perspective to learn more about Marsh and conservationism. For remember, it was in the hills of Woodstock, Vermont, where conservation received his first full breath. If man is destined to inhabit the earth much longer and to advance his natural knowledge with the rapidity which has marked his progress, he will learn to put a wiser estimate on the works of creation. I think rather than consider Marsh as somewhat of a hero who kind of woke up one day and had a vision for the future, I think you can characterize Marsh as having combined a breadth of experiences, life experiences, and kind of connecting them near the end of his life and providing meaning for himself and a lot of other people. Uh, for example, as a youngster, he was fluent in Greek and Latin by eight years old. Um, was fluent in 20 languages by the time he died in 1882. He was a US congressman. He was uh, ambassador to Turkey, ambassador to Italy. Uh, was in the business world and invested in woolen mills. 
um, was a tinkerer in a sense, an amateur in a lot of things. I think it, more than any one thing, it was the way he took all of these pieces of his life and at the end made observations and connections and linked them to have meaning. I spent my early life almost literally in the woods. A large portion of the territory of Vermont was within my recollections, covered with the natural forest. And having been personally engaged to a considerable extent in clearing lands and manufacturing and dealing in lumber, I have had occasion both to observe and to feel the effects resulting from an injudicious system of managing woodlands. He took the experience out in the woods when he was young. Um, this is where his earliest observations of deforestation were happening, was here in Woodstock. Uh, he also not only observed the destruction that was happening on the hillsides in Vermont, he was able to articulate what that meant for the rest of the, quote, ecosystem that we now call it, and what that ultimately would mean for civilizations, large civilizations like the Roman Empire, the, the Turkish Empire, the Mediterranean Basin in general. Um, so the one observation, one or two key observations in forests were, um, were dependent on the land. Huge civilizations need to be concerned about the prosperity that comes to that civilization from wise utilization of land. And I think that's his basic argument. Marsh is, uh a very interesting man for the 19th century. Of course, you have to realize that he grew up and lived his life um, well, well over a century before us. But he certainly understood this interconnectedness in life, that what you do uh, in the uh, top of a watershed affects uh, what happens in the bottom. I mean, and that's sort of a metaphor. I mean, you can look at, it, at watersheds as a metaphor for all human existence that we, are, we, we do live an interconnected existence. Uh, and particularly in today's global world, that's becoming more evident almost by the day. But Marsh was, Marsh was taking this view um, 150 years ago and saying that, well, what happens in one part of the country uh, can have an impact on uh, many other parts of the country and that um, the issues of his day, which were primarily deforestation, were not issues related to the region of New England. They were not necessarily just about the United States. They were about the world. And so there's this global vision that Marsh had, which is um, very appropriate for today's world. Was there any special upbringing that he received here in Vermont that allowed him to see world with a different set of eyes? That's a good question, um, because ironically, uh, Marsh did have a lot of a lot of eye trouble as a youngster. A lot of it from overreading and overstudying, um, reading maybe by poor light as a youngster. Um, he did damage his eyes from overstudy, um, but it's this exact thing that turned Marsh outward, outside, out into the hills, where he, um, instead of looking very closely at words, he now is looking at nature. And most of, of our great naturalists and, great, um, and many great poets and artists and so forth have a keen sense of observation in one way or another, and they're driven that way. And uh, by, by, in Marsh's uh, life, it was kind of kind of odd that he had this damaged eyesight all the way up to when he was teaching. To the natural philosopher, the descriptive poet, the painter, and the sculptor, as well as to the common observer, the power most important to cultivate and at the same time hardest to acquire is that of seeing what is before him. Sight is a faculty. Seeing is an art. Marsh in his writings really spoke about communities have a certain amount of power. How does that play out today? Well, you know, Marsh, Marsh spoke very eloquently and wrote very eloquently about the need for an ethic of environmental citizenship. That we were, if we entrusted our future to experts, we did so at our peril. Uh, that a sustainable society had to be, in, in, in effect, a democratic society. And he was writing about this at a time where uh, there wasn't a great 
any great tradition of sort of citizenship and participation in uh, environmental issues. Um, but he was really, in a way, breaking some very important ground. And he was warning us that uh, we had to, as a society, learn to make choices in a democratic and open way. He was not against scientists. In fact, he, he, he was a great admirer of progress, an admirer of scientific thought. But he was also had a tremendous respect for democracy and the importance of uh, a society coming, exercising um, a sense of empowerment, a sense of control, and a sense of choice over its future. Now, you think that came from his uh, Vermont, New England background, his look on democracy and the individual's role? Well, I think it came partially from growing up in New England and the the democratic traditions of New England town meetings, I think that obviously had a big part in his, in his thinking. Uh, he was a congressman. I mean, he, he was a state legislator. He certainly had that experience of being part of the democratic process. But also, I think he was certainly uh, concerned about the impact and effect of um, poor decisions that are uh, left in the hands of a very few people. And he certainly saw that in his travels in, in, in Europe and abroad. Uh, and he, you know, Marsh, Marsh's great hope uh, when he was uh, ambassador to Italy was the sort of the flowering of the birth of the Italian Republic. And that concurrent with that, he hoped it would be, in fact, a, a, um, a new new approach entirely to, to the environment and to living sustainably. The National Park Service offers many things to the American people. Well, one of the things that really is of value is that in our parks we, we try to model uh, ways to live well uh, in our environment, ways to live more sustainably and more in harmony. Um, and we try to practice that in the way we manage our parks so that uh, uh, they're preserved over, over time. So we are a little bit of a city on the hill, and that's part of our mission. Um, but there's probably no greater place to, to model behavior in terms of sustainability than our national heritage areas. And the Blackstone has this tr just tremendous potential to show how communities can work together and plan together so that the sense of place and uh, the character and quality of uh, the environment and um, the health and, and, and vigor of the communities, in fact, uh, can be modeled uh, and, and demonstrated uh, you know, sort of the best principles of sustainability. So it's, there are a lot of things to learn in our national park systems, but places like the Blackstone have this incredible potential that uh, is a real gift to the uh, national park system, but I think ultimately a real gift to the American people. Many circumstances conspire to invest with great present interest the questions how far man can permanently modify and ameliorate those physical conditions of terrestrial surface and climate on which his material welfare depends, how far he can compensate, arrest, or retard the deterioration which many of his agricultural and industrial processes tend to produce, and how far can he restore fertility and salubrity to soils which his follies or his crimes have made barren. One thing Marsh really worried about, and this would really worry him today in today's world, and you talk about issues like sprawl and the, and the, the, the kinds of changes that are occurring in all our communities throughout the country, in the Blackstone Valley, in Vermont. Uh, he was particularly concerned that at some point the pace of change may become too frantic or too fast to address it that we, he was arguing for this empowerment and this collective uh, effort at uh, making good choices in the way we live. But he was concerned that it might be increasingly difficult to do that if the pace of change just became too fast. And I think what we're seeing in today's world is the pace of change becoming, uh, accelerating and becoming um, uh, fast enough that it seems to outstrip our capacity to respond. I think his work um, is appropriate now. I think 
things are happening very quickly in our our environment, uh, quickly in terms of change. Uh, some of the warnings that Marsh uh, wrote about, um, we haven't heeded entirely. Some of the mistakes we made in the 19th century we're still making. Um, care of watersheds, you read in the news, we see in the news every day, uh, environmental problems. Now I think it's not just preserving nature, it's preserving uh, the culture that we feel so proud of and the heritage that we've sort of wrought in the United States. And I can't think of uh, a better place than this to hammer that home a little bit. And that's the message of Marsh. We have to take care of a place called home. So folks, how do we apply the lessons we've learned from the writings of George Perkins Marsh and our discussions with our National Park Service colleagues here and apply them to the ever-changing, fast-paced landscape of the Blackstone Valley? I think we have some work to do. We better get on home. Back in the Blackstone Valley, one term you'll hear when people start talking about growth, development, and conservation is build-out. It's a key term that describes a really unique bi-state collaboration between Rhode Island and Massachusetts. The Build-Out Analysis Project is a comprehensive look at the issues and direction of growth, land use, and preservation of Blackstone watershed. The communities of the Blackstone Valley have a lot of tough choices to make. To understand better just what those choices are and their consequences, we're going to attend the Community Preservation Super Summit, a bi-state presentation on growth in the Blackstone Valley. I think the Blackstone Valley communities are in a unique position because th they still have that fabric of uh, agricultural land, farming, uh, mixed with uh, old mill, uh, mills along the Blackstone that are being restored, uh, being used, being developed. Um, they still have uh, wonderful downtown centers. Uh, unlike uh, many parts of the state of Massachusetts and actually the state of Rhode Island where uh, sprawl development has ruined the farmland, has ruined the scenic vistas, has ruined the historic landscape. And so the communities down here really have that unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to define what will be theirs, not only for the short uh, few years ahead, but also for future generations. They wanted growth, but they wanted it, uh, even at that point, they were talking about trying to plan because they didn't want to be another Route 9, for instance, or as Cape Cod has turned out, uh, even with all its attractiveness from a tourism standpoint, the people who live there, especially during the summer, uh, have a hard time of it getting around and so they didn't want to turn into that sort of development. So they had a chance then to look at it. I think one of the key um, ingredients in the plan at that time was uh, what now has become the National Heritage Card. Uh, that there was a need for a unifying entity to help provide assistance, uh, planning capacity uh, for, for Carter communities because nobody had the resources and few still do to have a full-time planner, and even if they did, they were busy on local issues, not looking at the town boundaries and beyond. And, and so I think the Corridor Commission and the staff have been able to uh, provide that regional approach and then some federal resources that Congress has been generous enough to provide us to, uh, to help actually deliver some, some services to the communities. The information that's coming out today really shows that a lot of the issues that we're trying to deal with, whether we're talking about the state level or the local level, are issues that we have in common across the region, and in this case, across the whole valley. Um, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything gets washed out and it's all one community. Every community obviously has a lot of local identity. And when we're talking about regional approaches, you know, we really don't want to uh, diminish that, of course, at all. But we are dealing with issues like water supply. You, know, you look at some of the information here, the kind of new development that will occur uh, as it is allowed by current zoning and um, how many new residents, for example, will be added. I, in my introduction, uh, mentioned some things about Boroughville where the number of people would very much increase dramatically. And uh, with it, you get additional demand for roads, for water supply, for schools, for public safety uh, services, things like that. Um, so it's not only about what our community will look like when we have this development, but how we're going to provide uh, for the demands that that, that development uh, creates. To protect the water supply, to have enough supply in the future, you really need to have the regional approach. You really need to look across municipal boundaries, and in this case also across 
um, state boundaries because take the river. The river is perhaps the most visible asset of the valley. Uh, what happens in Rhode Island is immediately influenced by what people do with the Blackstone or to the Blackstone. It really makes sense for us to work together. If we don't, I, I'm afraid that the solutions will be inadequate. If you talk about growth, uh, it's hard to visualize normally. Uh, maybe you can, if you're familiar with the traffic exiting or coming into the valley at different times of day, uh, or even just trying to get around, you can get some sense that we've got a lot more vehicles around than we used to. If you have to go to a town meeting to vote to add on to a school, you get the sense that the, there are more kids around than there used to be. Uh, but I think the, the planning tools that this uh, effort that the, that the corridors helped to support and that the two states um, are embarking on will really give the average citizen and local boards a lot more power. Community preservation is, uh, uh, in the Community Preservation Initiative, is a bottoms-up smart growth initiative that allows communities to have the tools necessary to chart their own destiny to protect their quality of life. It's not a state imposed uh, smart growth policy. In fact, the Trust for Public Land has recognized us as one of the seven best smart growth policies in the nation. I think it's uh, uh, unique because it is uh, municipally based. It allows our communities to define their future. And by providing these GIS tools that are behind us, by asking the question, what is your current growth? Uh, what is your current zoning? And using JIS technology, showing communities what they look like today uh, and how does that compare to where they're going to be 20, 40, 60 years from now, it changes the dynamic. It no longer forces the question about you know, what's going to happen between now and the next uh, Board of Selectmen election or what's going to happen between now and the next you know, five-year regional plan. It forces communities to think uh, well out into the future, 25, 50 years. And by changing that dynamic, provides the tools for those communities to ask questions about, well, what does that mean about our future water supply? Do we have the water supply necessary to support the kind of growth that we've already zoned for? And according to our build-outs, um, this valley, the Blackstone Valley, does not. It'll be 14 million gallons a day short of drinking water supply at build-up. So I think communities have to start asking the question, uh, what is our carrying capacity? Where do we want to be? The other key thing, it's not the state telling the communities what to do, it's giving them the information. Once they see it, I think they see that this, one, there are, there are things they can do to, to channel that growth the way they can preserve quality of life. The maps, but more importantly, the software that has been developed allows local planners to do is change some of the inputs, some of the assumptions and then see, well, what would change if we approached it differently? What if we had, instead of low-density residential development, we had compact development through conservation zoning, for example? What would it look like then? And it allows people to identify on the map those areas that they really care about, uh, as well as those areas where uh, they have a lot of infrastructure for development, for example. Say, what if we maximize that as an asset, because we're not only talking about natural resources, we're not only talking about open space and farms and clean water, we're also talking about economic development. We have areas in the region that are very well suited for commercial and industrial development where we can create jobs, and that's part of the exercise as well, and that's what these tools allow us to, to focus on as well. We've come to recognize that, uh, uh, particularly in Rhode Island, the quality of life, uh, what the state has to offer. Uh, is one of its major assets. Um, that's what keeps Rhode Islanders there. That's what is now attracting other people to invest in our state. Um, and uh, through these types of planning efforts, we can ensure that we can still grow, still have a solid economic base, still provide what we want to in the future for our children in terms of quality education, affordable housing, yet still maintain that quality of life that uh, we so, so cherish. But it, 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 uh, we have to be mindful of what we're doing in terms of land use planning and transportation planning, economic development planning. I'm not sure it has to be either or. I think that there hopefully will be ways to preserve um, all those aspects of what makes uh, the valley unique. Um, but you don't preserve it by just reacting to development after the fact, which is now frequently the case. Someone proposes a new mall or, or a new subdivision, and all of a sudden people say, yeah, but that's the kind that 
that was open space that I was used to, that I grew up with loving in my community, and all of a sudden people are reacting to the development. Um, what we need is uh, identifying those special values up front, plan for protecting them, and at the same time plan for where do we want development to happen. If you do that, if you're ahead of that development curve, you're in a better position to save those different aspects instead of having to make a choice between either or, between the environment or the economy, between urban development or the rural landscape. You can preserve both. And I really believe that's going to be the next decade which defines the landscape by which future generations will live here in Massachusetts. We only have the next 10 years to define what will be here for the next 100, 200 years. And uh, by using GIS, by using the build-out analysis, by using the community preservation approach, uh, communities can uh, protect their quality of life. Working together, we can really deal with this. I think if we try to approach uh, and deal with growth as a town-by-town -town, uh, event, we're going to be, uh, it's going to be a divide-and-conquer kind of approach by those who want to just pave over everything. Uh, and I think working together, we can bring together enough good people who have the, enough good ideas uh, that they'll be able to pr channel that growth and preserve a good part of the quality of life that we think makes the Blackstone Valley so special. This is a project uh, that can work uh, uh, a, a multi-state approach to smart growth policy by working within a watershed. Now watersheds, as we all know, uh, you know, they transcend town boundaries. They transcend state boundaries uh, in, in this case. And it's great to show the country that we can use the watershed approach with uh, the Community Preservation Initiative uh, to help plan along a watershed like the Blackstone. Use that as a national model, not only for what we're doing between the state of Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, but for other states as well. If we want to preserve what we have and at the same time uh, grow as a region, we need to take responsibility for this. And it's not just federal and state government that can do it. Actually, we know as state officials that we cannot do it without local involvement. Here at the Chase Farm along the Great Road that connected the Rhode Island and Blackstone Valley communities is a great example of a town vision. The town of Lincoln, using various partners, purchased significant parcels of land here that represented its valued landscape. This farm represents agricultural Rhode Island. The Moffett Mill, just down the road, represents early industrial Rhode Island, for it was an 1812 machine shop initially. These historic sites and open spaces, connected together by a greenway, Give the citizens of Lincoln, Rhode Island, ample access to their proud heritage. It's a great example of good land use policy. Well, this has been National Park Service Chuck Arning with the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Carter. And these landscapes, these places in our community that we value so much. You know, the federal government, even your state government, does not have to physically own them to protect them. These landscapes that make up the fabric and the character of our community can be, and many say should be, the province of local government or local nonprofit organizations. And they can be protected that way through various partnerships necessary to build those relationships to save this valuable land. You know, at this time when Americans are reevaluating all the things about our life that are important to us, our families, our relationships, the places of heart, our work, our passion, all those things that are uniquely make us Americans Now's the time to look into our communities and find these landscapes of value and work to protect them. And it can happen. We have to start now, for the clock is ticking. Change will happen. How it happens is up to us. To paraphrase my National Park Service colleagues and George Perkins Marsh, it's time to take care of our own house, our own community, for those who come after us. Until next time, hope to see you in the valley.